So we have our gap, generally accepted accounting principles. And this is our foundation. This is our guidebook. This is our user manual for our accounting system. So gap is what we call it. Yeah, phonetically it's not correct. It should be probably something along the lines of gape, but G-A-A-P, gap, generally accepted accounting principles. So let's take a look at a few. Now there are way more than what we have presented in the textbook and that I talk about, but we're going to talk about the principles, the assumptions, the constraints that make up gap that are important to this course. So the first one I want to take a look at is the monetary unit. The monetary unit. And this one right here just tells us, hey, we need to use the correct form of the monetary, uh, monetary unit for our business. We are to or through the monetary unit principle, we are required to make sure that our financial statements are expressed in a single monetary unit. So in other words, we can't say, oh, I'm going to use the yen, oh, I'm going to use the peso, um, or I'm going to use the, the pound or the euro and the dollar all mixed up on one financial statement. That's not cool because they each have different value set for um, an item. So they're not equally the same. So this provides by only using one monetary unit for our financial statements, it helps to provide and make sure that there is a common measurement that we can use to track the economic events and the transactions that have taken place um, in the business. And for the US, we use the US dollar as our monetary unit. So the next one that we have here is the time period. The time period. And this one allows a company to report its economic activities on a regular basis for a specific period of time. I kind of like to, to explain this one in this way. It's kind of like the company's birthday. I know that sounds weird. I liken a company to a non-living person or a non-breathing person. Um, a company does everything a human does. Um, it defecates. <laughs> it consumes. It um, reproduces. It can birth out another company um, or some sort of subsidiary. Um, it eats, it consumes, can eat up another company. Um, and believe it or not, it has a birthday. So if we decide that we're going to run our company annually, then every year we have uh, a new set of information that we need to put out there for our users. Or if we decide that the company is going to operate every six months, then we are going to say that every six months we, we issue out new financial statements based on the transactions that and the data that we've uh, collected over the past six months. So that's the time period. Next, we have the business entity. And the business entity is a principle that limits the economic data in financial reports uh, that directly relates to the activities of a business. In other words, the business is viewed as an entity separate from its owners. So it is, it is like I said, it's a non-breathing person. It is its own self. It pays its own taxes. It consumes. It reproduces. It is, for lack of a better word, it is an entity. It is a um, non-living human. <laughs> and so thus, even though I may start a company, the company is separate from me, even though I may have started it. If you choose to invest in Microsoft, you are not a part of the business. The business is a separate entity from you. You are just a stockholder, whereas Microsoft is Microsoft. It is its own person, so to speak. It's its own self. Okay, the next one we have is going concern. 
and this is more of an assumption and it is the assumption that our financial statements are prepared assuming that the entity will continue forever and ever and ever and ever in other words it is the expectation that a company doesn't just up and, and die in five years or we're anticipating that to happen the whole point of the company is that it will live beyond the person who started it beyond the initial stockholders it is supposed to have an indefinite life so it, it's supposed to have immortality as a non-living human all right then we have conservative constraint and this one may or may not be listed in the book but i use it because it's going to come up in a future chapter and you need to be aware it provides guidelines for us and conservative constraint is really just us we err on the side of conservatism so in other words we round down we don't normally round up you know in math how they'll tell you oh if you have 89.5 you just round up well that's not necessarily so in accounting um that's not enough of a probability in some areas of accounting for us to round up that number 89.5 will probably round down it's not worth it and the reason is is that we never want to make something look better or be better or seem better than what we can prove it can be because that is a risk and that's something that accountants shy away from so we will err on the side of conservatism we see the glass half empty not half full we tend to be more pessimistic than optimistic actually you know us accountants we don't like the word pessimistic it's so negative we're realists like reality sets in and this is what it is um, we're not generally of that nature which is why a lot of people uh, I even caution if you have a CPA who is the CEO of a company buyer beware they are they're not that type of personality or person if they've been a CPA for years specifically if they've been auditors they will make the worst CEO ever the worst the worst I've seen it with my own two eyes um, it is just not good at all for the company because they are so conservative that the company doesn't make calculated risk and risk is good in order for it to move forward in the future and have a life beyond the today and to make moves that it needs to to make in order to move forward expand grow and have that immortality that we expect a company to have so this one's going to come up pretty soon so especially when we get to chapter five and six and on so that's that's when we're going to see again and i wanted to mention it even though it may or may not be listed in the textbook then we have measurement and this is a principle and it determines the amount that will be recorded and reported. Uh, the measurement principle requires that whatever we we record, the data that we record and thus report later on, must be objective and verifiable. In other words, we can't say, oh, I think it is or it should be. Listen, if you don't have some paper behind it, if you don't have a source documentation to prove it is what it is, whatever that value may be, then we have a measurement problem and we have, more importantly, an objective and verifiable problem. So we have to be really uh, careful by that, uh, with that. All right. Then we have another principle, historical cost. And um, this one is one that does not apply to everything in accounting, but to most things in accounting. Mm -hmm. For instance, if we purchase an asset, we record it at cost. It, it's historical cost, what I purchased it for. So if I purchased a building in 1980 and the building was $100,000, that building for accounting purposes stays at $100,000 even though we're in 2019 
we continue to value that building at its historical cost, its original cost, its purchase cost of $100,000. The reason being is, although, you know, in some other circles, real estate and finance, they would say, oh, well, it's a it's it's appreciated in value well that's that's great that you think that but how many of us know that you can get an appraisal and I can get 10 people to give me 10 different appraisals and even though someone would tell me oh that building is worth a million dollars now that doesn't mean that's what I'm going to sell it for and in accounting we are very exacting we are not going to just put down a random number that we think it's worth until we have that up oh, let's go back to that what conservative constraint says until we know it specifically and the measurement says hey is this verifiable just because someone appraised the the building at a million dollars doesn't mean that's what its value is because I can put it out there for sale for a million dollars and a buyer will come along and they may only pay me nine hundred and ninety thousand dollars for it so I had a problem now don't I because I valued in my book it's a million but it only sold for nine hundred ninety thousand now I have to record it as a loss we don't want to record it as a loss <laughs> we don't want to do that that that's no good and investors don't want to see that either and then what if in the in the in the I put it out there for a for million dollars I sell it for a million two hundred thousand now I have to record again I really don't want to do that either I have gotta pay taxes on that so we have to be really careful that we only sell it or list it for once we sell the item other than that it stays at its historical cost this is what we call the cost principle or the historical cost principle. All right. Next one we have here is the revenue recognition. You guys are going to love this one. Uh, these last two, you're going to love to hate them. <laughs> um, you're going to wrestle with this one, but I just need for you to understand uh, how this works in accounting. You've got to think differently than what you have may have been taught or what you think you know. So for accounting purposes and the purposes of this class you need to know about and understand the revenue recognition principle and this principle says that whenever you sell a good or service through your business we record it immediately we do not record it once we've gotten paid ah Cash is not a part of this. Cash and revenue are not synonymous. They're not equal. They're not the same. They're two different types of accounts. That, no relationship. One may lead to another, but that doesn't mean that they are direct, that they are in correlation with each other, not parallel. In other words, if you go to your dentist, no, let's go, you go to your doctor, you pay your copay, and your actual bill for medical services that you received is five hundred dollars does the doctor wait until the insurance company or you pay the medical bill to show that they've earned five hundred dollars that day <laughs> uh, no um they say okay i've earned five hundred dollars today because i did five hundred dollars worth of medical services for this particular patient so i need to record it i earned five hundred dollars today regardless of whether you or the insurance company pays or not now that is a separate situation payment receipt of payment that they get but they have to record that revenue let's make it a little closer to home do you wait until you get paid to acknowledge that you're on your payday? Let's say you get paid, you got paid Friday. Do you wait until Friday to say, I have earned $1,000? No, ma'am. No, sir. Every day you go to work, you are, you are openly, you are very aware of what you earn that day. And you know, just confirmation of payment is just a payment is just confirmation of what you already know that you've earned on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Yeah, right? So that's how it works in accounting. When you have delivered the service, you provide the product, you earn the right to that money. You've earned it. 
Revenue equals earnings. Revenue equals earnings. Write that down in your notes. Revenue equals earnings. And then right below it, revenue does not equal cash. Ah. Revenue equals earnings. Right below it in your notes, revenue does not equal cash. All right. Let's go along. Last one. Expense recognition. So here's another one that you guys are probably not going to be prepared for. You're going to learn to... To hate, love to hate this one too but it is what it is for accounting purposes expenses are not considered expenses when I pay them expenses are expenses way before you pay them when your utility bill comes in that's an expense now when you choose to pay it in cash is a whole nother conversation but as soon as that bill comes in it says you have used up okay so the bill that you get uh, this month, whatever month that it is, let's say it's January, the bill that you get in January is for expenses or usage of the utility bill for the previous 30 days. Yeah, you're not paying forward, you're paying backwards, right? So what happens is when that bill comes in, these are expenses that have already, what we called in accounting, they have incurred, they have taken place. And so what happens is, is I must record them immediately in my accounting system. I've identified this as an expense. I record and store the data from this transaction. <laughs> and I pay it later on. Or I could pay it immediately. But usually, and for business purposes, we're not paying it immediately. We usually send out all of our payments once or twice a month. And so what happens is, do not equate expenses to payment. Expenses do not equal payment. Just because you have an expense as a company doesn't mean you've paid it. That just means that the expense has been incurred. You have used a service or you have used an asset in your business to help operate your business, but that doesn't mean that you've paid it. Payment is another situation. So for accounting purposes, the expense recognition says we record expenses when they've taken place, when they've incurred not when we pay them. Now, if it happens to happen on the same at the same time, fantastic. But that is not the rule. That's the exception for accounting purposes. So these and many, many more, these principles, these assumptions, these constraints are the guidelines that are listed in GAAP are generally accepted accounting principles as our user manual for our accounting system, for our accounting system.